Hello, everybody. Thank you, Sherry, and welcome. I'm going to go off camera just to preserve our bandwidth for the duration of the presentation, and I'll turn my camera back on toward the end. But welcome, everybody. We're glad that you are here, and we're going to talk about the developmental assessments using the Bailey 4. And our focus today really is thinking about the interrelated nature of early development. And our focus is going to be on how we can use the interrelated nature of early development to maximize the efficiency of the administration. In terms of what we're going to be focused on, we first want to tell you that we will be showing you some actual test items. So the training materials are protect protected by federal and international copyright laws. I did not include the actual item content or the descriptions for the items in the handout, but you will certainly see those here during the presentation. And as a qualified Bailey 4 user, you are granted permission by Pearson to use the materials for training only. They're not to be shared with any non-authorized user and are not for any other distribution. As we know, when we use standardized tests, it is our professional responsibility, according to our ethical guidelines, to ensure the security of the test materials and to safeguard the proper use of the test materials. And these security provisions apply to the materials that I'm going to reference here during the training as well. This webinar is available for continuing education credit. And once we have verified that you've met the requirements for CE credit, either from AOTA, APA, ASHA, which I'll talk about separately, or NASP, Pearson will send your certificate to the email address on record through our webinar registration system. We will verify through Pearson's electronic attendance record that you attended the entire session, and we ask you to submit a webinar session evaluation form, which, as Sherry mentioned, you can download from event resources. The evaluation form is available under event resources. There is also an attendance roster, which you need to complete only if you are viewing this in one location as a group. And when you submit your, your evaluation form, indicate if you want CE credit for AOTA, APA, or NASP, and you need to save the completed form, send it as an attachment to Darlene K. Davis at Pearson.com no later than October 30th. Now, sometimes um, some of us snap a photo with our camera and we would send a PNG or JPEG file as an attachment. Please know that we cannot process those files. Um, I mentioned that you need to attend the entire session. Credit is not available for attending um, part of the session. And if you would please allow 12 business days for us to deliver your certificate. Now, some of the same information applies to ASHA CEUs. We will submit completed CE forms to ASHA if you attend the entire 60 minutes of the live session. Again, we'll use our verification report to verify that. And you'll complete the forms either on a print copy and then you would mail them to Darlene Davis down at the bottom. You could see Darlene Davis, Pearson, 19500 Bulverde Road in San Antonio, Texas. Or you can complete the forms using Adobe Reader, save the completed forms, and then email them. And again, darlene.k.davis at pearson.com and the deadline is October 30th. Again, the attendance sheet is necessary only if more than one person is viewing at your location. You do need the evaluation form and the ASHA participant form. Again, over to the right, we will not submit completed, completed CE forms if they are mailed beyond the deadline, which is October 30th. You can't fax them in. Again, I mentioned the scanning photo images. Um, we won't, we can't process those. And again, 
Um, you must attend the entire session. Also, no CEs, no CE credit is awarded for viewing the recording on PearsonAssessments.com. You must view the live session. In terms of disclosures, um, I am the presenter, Gloria McCoo. I am employed by Pearson Clinical Assessment, and Pearson Clinical Assessment is the sponsor for the AOTA, APA, ASHA, and NASP continuing education provider. I have no, no relevant non-financial relationships to disclose. All of the assessments that we're going to be talking about today, and we are in fact talking about only one of our assessments, the Bailey 4, um, the Pearson Assessment Division develops and distributes assessments and intervention tools for speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, psychologists, and we will focus on appropriate use of the Bailey 4. So I hope most of you received the handout or were able to download the handout from event resources, and you could certainly use that to follow along. Most of the slides I'm going to show you are included in the handout, except some of the actual item references are redacted in the handout. But for purposes of our webinar today, I'm going to start by describing unique characteristics of infants and toddlers. And I want to use the unique characteristics of infants and toddlers to talk about how the Bailey 4 allows for assessment across domains. Because when we think about some of the unique characteristics of infants and toddlers, we think about the integrated or the interrelated nature of early development. So for example, I have these two pictures here of one little boy, the boy to the right, um, Camden, who's 10 months old um, in this picture, and then Alex to the left, who is 30 months old in this picture. And one of the things that you could see is that both of these um, children are doing something with their right hand. Um, but it may surprise you to know that Alex is actually working on an item that loads on our Bailey 4 fine motor subtest, whereas Camden is working on an item that loads on the cognitive subtest. In fact, from both of these pictures, I can get some information about fine motor or visual motor integration skills, which is the focus of our webinar today, thinking about how early development is highly interrelated and how assessing or presenting an item on one subtest allows us to um, collect information on other subtests as well. So in terms of our time, we're going to spend about 15 minutes talking about the unique characteristics of infants and toddlers, another 15 looking at the integrated nature of early development conceptually, and then 25 minutes talking about the integrated nature of early development and how Bailey 4 has taken that into account in developing the items. And then we'll leave about five minutes at the end for questions and answers. So I think in terms of the content for the webinar, we're really thinking about considerations in conducting developmental assessments. So I want to start out by thinking about the need for developmental assessment. And really the reason why developmental assessment is important is because we want to make sure that we can provide any specialized services that infants and toddlers need in order to develop typically in order to develop um, skills and behaviors in the appropriate sequence and at the appropriate rate. So the reason why we conduct developmental assessments is really to identify the need for early intervention, to make sure that we know if infants and toddlers need any specialized services in order to develop along the typical trajectory. So when we think about the early intervention in the United States, the, um, the mandate for early intervention is provided by, the fed, by federal legislation, IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, specifically Part C. So you're thinking about the early intervention program for infants and toddlers with disabilities, which um, those of us in the U.S. know 
is the program that assists states in operating a comprehensive statewide program of early intervention services. And you're thinking about infants and toddlers with disabilities as well as their families and infants and toddlers starting at birth and going up through um, two years. So birth through two or birth to age three years. The eligibility for early intervention services really is determined um, state by state, um, but we are focusing on the same group of children, infants and toddlers, beginning at birth and going up to age three. And we're focused in terms of early intervention on infants and toddlers in this age range who have developmental delays, which would be identified based on the developmental assessment, or who have been diagnosed with a physical or mental condition that creates a high probability that the child will suffer a developmental delay. So you're thinking about conditions um, like blindness or Down syndrome, for example, that place the child at risk for a developmental delay. And again, the criteria for eligibility really are determined um, state by state. But effectively, um, regardless of the eligibility criteria that are specified by the state, um, states will focus, according to IDEA Part C, will focus on five developmental areas. When we think about those developmental areas, you're thinking about physical development, including vision and hearing, physical development, including motor development, um, cognitive development, communication, social or emotional development, as well as adaptive development. So when you think about developmental assessments, often what you find is that most developmental assessments will include assessments of these five developmental areas. And certainly, those of you who are familiar with Bailey 4, you'll recognize these um, five developmental domains included in Bailey 4 as well. <clears throat> So I want to transition to say a few words about the unique characteristics of infants and toddlers and how the unique characteristics um, of infants and toddlers inform the development of the, inform the content, if you will, of developmental assessments. So one of the things when you think about infants and toddlers and you think about the development, we often think about the development at the course of development as being dynamic and uneven. So if you think about an infant who is a week old, for example, who is using or demonstrating simple reflexes, when you think about that development at the neurologic level, certainly at some point what you're going to find is that you will have more of a motor response. So, so development proceeds from the neurologic to the motor, to the sensory motor, to the cognitive. So even when I'm using um, sensory motor, I'm demonstrating sensory motor behaviors, um, at some point in my development, those are really in response to things that I am doing consciously. So when you think, for example, about children as they're getting older, they're starting to use the same skill, like for example, we have a little baby in my family, and I remember when he was about a week old, you'd put your finger in his, um, in his little hand, and his fingers would reflexively close around your finger, right? So that would be the neurologic. Now he's a little older, and what we're finding is that he is consciously um, closing his hand um, around my finger when he wants to. And when he doesn't want to, he ignores me. So it starts out as a motor movement. It becomes a means to an end. For example, if I am holding him and he wants to touch my face, he's looking at me, he's probably recognizing me, and then there is that really, it's, it's really more purposeful, more purposive. So you're thinking about development as being dynamic and uneven. So when you're thinking about developmental assessments, given this unique characteristic of infants and toddlers, 
um, an assessment tool for measuring abilities of infants and young children doesn't necessarily lend itself to a stable structure across different ages. And in fact, um, when we look at some of um, Nancy Bailey's work, Nancy Bailey, the author of of the original Bailey, um, she emphasized that the development of abilities in the first two years of life does not follow a neat a neat pattern of mental and motor abilities. Again, think about the fact that these abilities are highly interrelated. So you'd, you'll see developmental assessments really take that into account when they are looking at items that would fall um, into, that would load primarily because they they never really fall neatly into one or another domain. They might have a primary loading on one domain, might be um, a primary loading of cognitive, for example, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other abilities that are involved. So this dynamic and uneven course of development really is something that we have to take into account when we're developing um, developmental assessments. In addition to the dynamic and uneven course of development, infants and toddlers have a limited attention span, right? Um, so when you think about attention span, and I, I just pulled out two different ages here to make the point that if I'm looking at little Lila here, who's nine months old, the attention span of a nine-month-old child like Lila is maybe about a minute for a single action type of activity, such as she's doing here playing with a toy. In other words, if I introduce a new activity or, or some other activity gets introduced maybe into her visual field, that would distract her attention from what she's doing. Compared to um, Parker to the right, who is 35 months old, theoretically, he can generally pay attention to a toy or to another activity for between five and eight months. But during this time, and you can notice Parker, he's actually looking at somebody, right? He's maintaining eye contact with somebody. Um, he is paying attention to an adult across from him who's speaking to him at the same time. Again, when you think about attention span, it's really important to think about the age range. And for the Bailey Four, the age range starts at 16 days and goes up through 42 months. Now, when I talk about the fact that Lila can maybe pay attention for um, about a minute and Parker can maybe pay attention for between five and eight minutes, Please recognize, of course, that these are generalizations, right? How long a child is truly able to focus is dependent on a number of factors. Like if, um, if Parker were to see something that really attracts his interest, he's much more interested in what goes on around him, um, he might be distracted from this task. Also think about some physical factors. Am I hungry? Um, at one point when we were working with Lila, she actually got a little hungry and started to fuss. And once we gave her some Cheerios, you noticed her behavior started to settle down. So the level of interest in the activity, um, whether or not they're hungry, whether or not they're tired. One of the things that we say about little ones is that they tend to be very hedonistic. So whatever gives them pleasure right at that moment, that is where their attention is going to be focused. So developmental assessments really need to take that into account um, in developing the tasks, right? So that there is a variety of tasks and that we can transition from one task to another relatively quickly. Also, the activity level of the infant or toddler is, um, is important and will determine how we structure the content of developmental assessments. Um, I'm sure we all know. We all know little ones who, um, from the time they were babies, um, they were squirmy, they moved around. Um, when they started crawling, they were all over the place. Some infants um, have a much higher activity level than other infants. So if we're conducting developmental assessments, such as here for Rhea um, to the left and to the right for Matthew, um, 
are we embedding some activities that will allow them to actually purposely engage in some activities, such as maybe walking around? You could see Rhea actually walking around spontaneously, but she's walking on tiptoes, which in fact is one of the items on Gross Motor. Here is Matthew playing with a ball. While they are engaged in activity because we know that their activity level um, requires them to move around, might we be able to use those spontaneous behaviors to actually score some of the items? So when you think about these characteristics, um, there are certain things that they tell us about how we need to structure um, our assessments. So for example, if you think about the dynamic and uneven course of development, we want to make sure that we cover um, the developmental progression of whatever constructs we're measuring. So for example, if we're measuring language, um, attention and preverbal behaviors, if I think about 16 days old up to 42 months, these would be the types of language skills that theoretically we'd expect um, infants and toddlers to be developing. Vocabulary um, development, looking at lang language content, vocabulary development, looking at language concepts, certainly language structure, um, like the morphology, um, morphosyntactic, like the ING, um, who is, what is he doing? He is sleeping, he is playing, social referencing and joint turn-taking, and then receptively, auditory comprehension is important. But here's the thing about developmental assessments. Some children, even though um, theoretically you would think, well, they have moved beyond the stage of pre-verbalization, um, you might still need to present some items that assess the attentional focus, right? So you'll notice that these items are embedded when you look at the Bailey 4. Some of the items that assess pre-verbal behaviors are at the front end of the scale, but they are, some of them are throughout the scale. And similarly for language content, um, because we know that children's attention span is short, we want to use different methods to actually get at the information. So in language content, for example, I may um, ask you to show me that you know the meaning of words by presenting concrete objects. Show me the baby. Show me the cup, for example. And then I may present pictures assessing the same concept using pictorial representations. So again, you'll find that looking at the, the content coverage across the Bailey 4 age range, and you could do this same thing for cognitive, for fine motor, and for, for gross motor, you could see the developmental progression of fine motor skills um, theoretically starting at 16 days and going up through 42 months. So you'd have that content coverage. The other thing is because we know that children, little ones, I mentioned um, they, they pretty much will do what is of interest to them at the time. They don't necessarily respond um, on command. And they definitely are not like older children where they are really focused on pleasing the examiner, right? So one of the things that has always been important on the Bailey is including caregivers in the evaluation process. And the Bailey 4 certainly does that as well. And we'll talk more about the inclusion of caregivers in the evaluation process. The other thing that's really important when we think about developmental assessments is recognizing that there is some thing between not being able to demonstrate a skill and actually demonstrating a skill at the level of mastery. So the scoring approach that is used in developmental assessments, and this is used in many developmental assessments, should allow for us to um, document and credit um, emerging skills. So the items on cognitive language and motor subtests would either be scored two points 
if the child's performance demonstrates mastery, zero points if the child's performance demonstrates the skill or behavior is not present, or one point if the child's behavior demonstrates the skill or behavior is emerging. So all of these characteristics of the Bailey Four are really being responsive to the unique characteristics of infants and toddlers. But I think one of the things that we believe is probably going to be um, especially helpful is really thinking about the integrated nature of early development and how using the integrated nature of early development can really maximize the efficiency of the administration. In other words, reduce the administration time. So I wanted to talk just a little theoretically about the interrelatedness of early development. And there are a number of researchers who have addressed this issue when we think about about what takes place when you think about um, about the development of infants and toddlers from 16 days to three and a half years old, what takes place during the first three years of life that turns this little dependent newborn into a sophisticated three-year-old. And if you think about three-year-olds, um, what they do, it's really amazing what they do, right? They walk, um, they talk while they're walking, they're solving problems, they're managing relationships with adults, with other children, they're getting ready to share. Um, maybe if they want something, they find a way to get it. Um, well, Ross Thompson um, has done a lot of work and, and wrote this, what I thought was a really good article in one of the issues of the future of children about the development in the first years of life. And his description really takes us to the heart of what we're talking about today, which is how early development is highly interrelated. So when we think about what happens in terms of development in four domains, in the body, in the mind, in the person, and in the brain, and considering that these domains are highly interrelated, let's take a look at what happens. What happens in the brain, for example? Well, brain development begins within the first month after conception, right? So, so effectively, um, by maybe the sixth prenatal month, um, nearly all of the neurons that populate the mature brain have been created. And once these neurons are formed, they quickly migrate to the brain region where they will function. They become differentiated, they assume specialized roles, and they form connections, right? Those, um, those synapses, those connections and effectively, um, the neurons continue to form um, those synapses or connections with other neurons. And what's really important when you're thinking about brain development, um, certainly maturation is important, but early experience plays an important role in which synapses are retained or eliminated. So I'll talk a lot, and, and, and Dr. Thompson talks a lot about the importance of early experiences. Now, when you think about the growth of the body, I think perhaps um, the most impressive developmental accomplishments of the early years are perhaps the most visible, right? So you think about the physical size. Obviously, the child is getting bigger. The body proportions are changing, especially the baby. The head looks really big. As the child um, develops, you notice that the head doesn't look as big in relation to the rest of the body. There are changes in sensory acuity. And of course, um, you think about how the child grows, the child develops through um, through maturation, but again, experience is really important. So for example, nutrition, um, nutritional health is an important contributor to physical development. Um, when you think about the development of the mind or the growth of the mind, certainly how does the mind grow? Again, the mind grows through crucial inputs from the environment, also through those innate information processing abilities. But one of the things that I want to show you when you look at the growth of the mind 
is really that sometimes it is really difficult to separate the cognitive um, part of, of the mind from the language part of the mind, right? So when you think about children, they're able to, um, their concept knowledge is growing, their memory is growing, their problem solving is growing, they're also learning new words, but they're using their language to explain concepts, to explain their developing ideas. I think um, whether or not, and in, in, in there are there is no clear consensus on which comes first. Um, does cognitive precede language? Does language precede cognitive? Um, I think it shouldn't surprise you that um, that psychologists like Piaget believes that um, language develops in service to thinking, whereas linguists like Chomsky believe that um, language or speech comes first and then um, cognitive comes after. Here's the reality. Um, at some point, and here is where the research is clear and where there is consensus, um, at some point, um, once language and cognitive ability have developed, the two um, actually work together. So I think in language, I use language to explain my thoughts. So the two at some point become highly um, indistinguishable. If you think about um, about cognitive tests, for example, and you were thinking about maybe older children or older adults, one of the important parts of, of cognitive assessment is crystallized ability, right? Which is effectively, you think about it, um, really looking at language. But all of this, the development of the body, the development of the mind, all of that happens in a social context. So when you think about the early years, they really provide lessons in relationships. So the first relationship, of course, is with the parent or caregiver. Is the attachment to the caregiver secure? Is it insecure? Am I able to regulate my own behavior? Do I understand what adults mean when they set limits, um, when they expect compliance? Um, as infants mature, they begin to learn strategies for managing their emotions. So again, you think about all of this development as happening in an interrelated way. Now, when you think about what children actually do, um, you could see that interrelationship. So, for example, children learn a lot from exploring their environment. And in fact, Piaget talks a lot about the importance of exploration. See a little boy to the left who is actually exploring his environment, and you think about development in terms of domains. Well, here, for example, he's using pots and pans. He's using wooden spoons. Is he um, looking at making sounds? Is that maybe related to, to expressive communication? Um, is he thinking about, hey, I have this little um, pan that fits on my head. I'm going to use that as a, head, uh, as a hat. Is he um, using representational play? Again, representational play is a really good way um, to facilitate cognitive development. We also see, see the visual motor integration, right? He's holding the spoons. He is making sure that the spoon actually hits where he wants it to. Over to the right, you could see maybe here's this little one. You could see some gross motor. She is um, sitting up, maybe supported. Um, she's maybe hearing her parents talk. Maybe they're pointing to pictures. Maybe they're associating colors with the pictures. Maybe they're associating words. So again, you're thinking about language. You're thinking about motor. You're thinking about cognitive. Similarly, if you look at the picture on the right first, um, certainly she is um, visual motor integration is probably the primary loading for this type of task. But um, might we also look at the colors? Can she maybe use her color knowledge to, um, to label these colors. Again, you think about what is going on here. 
visual perceptual when you think about um, cognitive development. And then to the left, where maybe this they're engaged in some kind of play, and the one child to the left is feeling sick, and then she's giving her some medicine, so she's playing doctor. So again, is there language involved? What about cognitive abilities? Again, you could see how when you watch children, they are really combining skills and behaviors from all of these developmental domains. So on the Bailey 4... We assess um, development in five broad domains, the five domains I referenced um, previously, certainly cognitive, language, and motor, um, but in addition, also social, emotional, and adaptive behavior. Now, social, emotional, and adaptive behavior, I mentioned already based on Dr. Thompson's research that um, social, emotional really includes the cognitive language and motor because the development of the mind really happens in that social context. But when you think about social emotional development, you think about um, the ability to regulate one's own behavior, the ability to communicate needs, um, the ability to use emotions um, or to use emotional signals to solve problems. Like when my two-year-old throws himself on the ground because um, I give him one cookie instead of the two that he um, asked for. So again, are, are they using social emotional signals to solve problems? And then adaptive behavior. Adaptive behavior is really a collection of skills. I always think about adaptive behavior as including um, skills from all of these domains, conceptual from the cognitive social as well as practical. You think about self-help skills like eating and brushing teeth as really involving motor skills, involving language. Like when your little one says, I do it myself. He doesn't want you to help him brush his teeth because um, he wants to do it himself. Again, adaptive behavior really looks at all of these developmental d domains. And on the Bailey Four, um, we really wanted to identify those interrelationships statistically, right? So table 4.1 in the Bailey Ford Technical Manual looks at the intercorrelations of the cognitive language and motor subtests. And I want to draw your attention to the bottom of this table because I want to focus on the in the score column, you have the five subtests up at the top cognitive, receptive communication, expressive communication, fine motor and gross motor. And then under those, you have the, the abbreviation for the scales, language and motor. If you look at the language scale and you look across at those subtests, you'll notice that the correlations are highest between language and receptive and expressive communication, which is exactly what you'd expect. The next highest, a moderate correlation between language and cognitive. And then when we look at motor and cognitive, 0.67 would be that correlation. Again, when you think about cognitive and language, as I mentioned, those two are highly interrelated. So that probably explains that correlation. So let's go to the Bailey Four and we'll look at the integrated nature of early development. One of the things that I hope you saw from those unique characteristics that I talked about is really that it's important for us in working with infants and toddlers to use multiple methods to collect the information we need and to get the information from multiple sources. So when we look at the cognitive language and motor scales, we collect the information primarily through direct interaction with the parent, with the child, and the parent or caregiver is included in that process. So the Bailey Four assesses developmental delay in cognitive language and motor areas by using three interrelated elements to present the items. First, over to the bottom left, we administer structured test items. Then up at the top, 
We also collect information through direct observation of behaviors and milestones, so behaviors that the child demonstrates spontaneously. And then the third component, which is um, new to the Bailey Four, um, the parent or caregiver is actively involved in the evaluation process. So for some items, we can actually ask the parent or caregiver a question, and based on the parent or caregiver's response, we score the item either two, one, or zero. So on our Q Global site, those of you who use the Bailey 4 on our Q Global platform, we've identified each item on each of the subtests, and I pulled out some from the cognitive subtest here, items 1 through 15 on the left, and then um, 67 through 81, 81 items on the cognitive subtest. And you can see the ones over to the right, 67 through 81, all of those require a structured presentation. But the ones over to the left, they all require a structured presentation as well. But some of them could be scored theoretically through observation or through the caregiver response to a caregiver question. So again, think about the fact that many of these items, actually just like on Bailey 3, can be scored through observation. So when you think about direct interaction with the child, again, collecting the information for cognitive language and motor, and another method that we use to collect information is um, for social, emotional, and adaptive behavior, where the parent or caregiver is the one who provides the information. So I want us to start thinking about how the Bailey Four um, actually allows us to focus on the interrelationship between these domains. And I'm going to use the cognitive subtest to illustrate, but you can do the same thing for language and for motor. So what we think about is what are the cognitive abilities that are assessed using the cognitive subtest, um, starting with sensory and attention to novelty, habituation, object use and imitation, problem solving, visual motor and perceptual memory, play, classification and concepts. And you do the same thing for language. What do the language subtests measure? I showed you this developmental progression um, before. Attention, vocabulary in terms of content and concepts, language structure, social referencing and auditory comprehension. And then for motor, again, thinking about 16 days old, what would you expect in terms of fine motor, in terms of gross motor, in that developmental progression from 16 days up to 42 months? So fine motor, am I tracking? Am I paying attention visually, horizontal tracking, vertical tracking? Am I reaching? Am I grasping? Am I manipulating objects? What about grabbing a pencil or a crayon? and then motor planning and motor speed. And then from gross motor, thinking about the progression from movement of limbs and postural reactions to sitting, standing, and then ultimately um, motor planning, running and stopping on command, for example. But here is what I want us to think about. And let me use this as an example. I'm gonna use the cognitive subtest to show how you would use the format of Bailey 4 to actually maximize the efficiency of your administration. So let's say I have here all of the items that assess sensory and attention to novelty. So I look at all of these items. Item one comes when picked up. Item two looks at objects. Item 13, exploring object. Item 14, brings to mouth. Um, item 17, reaches, obtains objects. And here's what I think about. How will I know that this um, toddler explored the object? How will I know that the, to the toddler brought the object to his or her mouth? reached for obtained an object? Well, it's because the child probably did something with his or her hand. Now, so what I do is I go to the observation checklist um, and these, the observation checklist lists by subtest the items that theoretically or that often are scored through incidental observation. So if I am manipulating an object or exploring an object or bringing it to mouth, 
Item 10 right here. Might you see that the child is freely rotating wrist from palm down to palm up? Again, item 10, distal rotation. Maybe item 12, reaches for, touches, block. If I grasp the object, what type of grasp did you see? Did I use a whole hand grasp? Did I use a thumb fingertip grasp? So the way that you maximize the efficiency is that you either use this observation checklist and you put a little check mark in that box to the right, or you go immediately to that section in the record form or on the digital platform, and you identify that you already have the information you need to score distal rotation, to score maybe um, the type of grasp that you are seeing. Um, again, that's the way that you think about how these items work going to skip through some of these because habituation really doesn't have a good connector to um, to some of those other domains. Those are items that you really do have to present. But here, for example, object use and imitation. And even in terms of the cognitive category, that already tells you that the child is probably going to use some type of object. You're going to bang the object. You're going to pat the table. You're going to pick up blocks. You're going to hold them. You're going to ring the bell, which means that you're picking it up and you're ringing it. You're going to stir the spoon in the cup. You're going to put blocks in the cups over to the right. You push the car. Um, 36, squeezing object. You squeeze the little duck. 38 and 46, you place pegs into a pegboard. 48, you use a pencil to pull a duck toward you, the child that is. 57, you imitate a two-step action. Um, I put the duck on the spoon and I make the duck fly. Again, the output demand, and this is where I'm going with this, right? This is where that interrelatedness comes in. All of these items require some kind of visual motor integrative demand. And can I go to my fine motor observation checklist, identify all of the items that theoretically can be scored through incidental observation? Um, I could probably score some items in terms of grasp. You notice grasp items. Did I use a, um, a hold hand grasp, a palmer grasp, a transitional grasp, and so on? Same thing when I look at visual, motor, and perceptual items. Again, these are items that you could see have this visual motor integration at the output phase. Um, again, are you able to score some of those? Some of the memory items, again, some would have a visual motor integration um, demand at the output phase, but repeating words and repeating number sequences would have a a an expressive demand at the output phase. Might that allow me to score some of the items on expressive communication? Let me say something about expressive communication. The order in which we present, we recommend you present the subtests on Bailey 4. You start with cognitive, and this is the order in which they are um, arranged in the record form and on our digital platform. So you start with cognitive, receptive communication, expressive communication, fine motor and gross motor. Let me tell you, from my experience, when we get to expressive communication, um, there are 37 items on expressive communication. 27 of those 37 items appear on this observation checklist, which means theoretically I could score 27 items through incidental observation. Well, I don't need 27, right? Because the number I need really depends on the age of the child. But if I were working with a little three-month-old, um, notice that items one through 17, I definitely won't get to 17 for a little three-month-old. So all of the items on expressive communication, I probably likely have the information um, if I start my assessment with the cognitive subtest. Children will vocalize spontaneously, and as soon as I hear those vocalizations, do I see a social smile? It, do I hear a vowel sound, a consonant sound? You go ahead and you put your little check mark on the observation checklist. By the time you get to expressive communication, often you have all the information that you need in order to, um, to pretty much 
to pretty much score um, expressive communication. So again, you could see the interrelationship, the interconnectedness between cognitive and motor, between cognitive and expressive communication. Most of the items toward the end of the scale, as I mentioned, um, require the structured presentation and typically um, Typically, you can't credit these um, by through observation, so we have to present these. But again, you still are able to see some fine motor skills. Um, number 70, counting one-to-one -one correspondence, expressive language. So you still can look at the output demand and see if you might be able to score, to cross-score some of those items. But here is to pull it all together what you're thinking. When you are thinking about interrelatedness, what is really key and what you want to consider is the response demand. How do you know that a child is able, for example, um, looking at Piaget's um, classification, maybe I have red, blue, red, blue, red, and then I need the child to complete the pattern. That's a cognitive task. How do I know the child is able to complete that cognitive task? Because the child, and let me just say this, because this is gonna be one of the items on fine motor, because the child isolates and extends the index finger and grasps the correct color peg and puts it into the pegboard. Again, when you think about the response type, that drives you to the other subtest where you can cross score um, some of the items based on a presentation of an item on a different scale. So this is really the general concept when you think about interrelatedness. Okay, so when you think about, um, about what we said we would do, we said that we would, um, we said that we would look at the unique characteristics of infants and toddlers, and we talked about certainly their attention span, their activity level, the dynamic and uneven course of development, and I hope to see how those characteristics really informed um, the content of Bailey 4. We talked about how early development is integrated across domains, starting with Dr. Thompson's research and looking at some of the actual behaviors that, that young children will demonstrate. And you could see that those behaviors involve skills from across domains. So as much as test publishers work to say, this item has a primary loading on cognitive, for example, we also need to recognize that the same item could have multiple um, secondary loadings on different, um, different subtests, right? And then how the items on the Bailey 4 allow for assessment across domains. Thinking especially about the response demand, how the child actually lets you know that he or she, that his or her reasoning um, is developmentally appropriate, for example. So again, these two that I talked about, where you're thinking about both of these items giving you information about visual motor integration, but one of them, Camden on the right, also giving you information that allows you to score the item on the cognitive subtest. So let's see if there are a few questions that we might be able to answer. Are there any questions, um, Shelley, that um, you would like to pose for the group? Yes, yes, there are, Gloria. Thank you. Um, I think a, a lot of them have been answered, but there's a couple that I thought were probably relevant for the whole group as well. So um, one question, I think, um, can this can the Bailey 4 be used with severe or profound um, cognitive disability, for example, um, used for observations, but not for IQ for an older child, for example, a 10 year old child who can't take a tr traditional cognitive assessment like the WISC, WISC 5. Um, I hope I've phrased that right. Um, so does that make sense? Yes. So, so if I understand the question, it's really, can we administer the Bailey 4 outside of the, the age range for which the items were standardized. And we describe that in the manual and the answer to the question is yes. Now here is um, the caveat, you will not be able to derive 
any kind of standardized scores like scaled scores or standard scores because of course um, the raw scores are adjusted by age um, but what you would be able to derive would be age equivalents and sometimes I think that the age equivalent might be um, might be helpful when you think about what it is that you the purpose for which you need the score so the answer is yes and you'll be able to generate age equivalents Wonderful. Thanks, Gloria. There's been also a couple of questions around um, virtual administration and um, whether or not you can obtain a standardised score from the observation items only and, um, you know, how to sort of bit of clarification around remote administration of the of the Bailey Fort. I wonder if you could okay. speak to that a little bit. Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. And that's a really good, um, good question. We on our website um, have provided information about how to use the Bailey 4 as part of a remote administration. And um, certainly, I talked about the two components of the Bailey 4, right? You have the social, emotional, and adaptive behavior questionnaire. And certainly, that component can be administered remotely, whether through remote on-screen administration or through on-screen administration. That is part of our Q Global platform. Now, for cognitive language and motor, um, it should come as no surprise that that's a little more complex. And we talk on we describe in our telepractice guidance documents um, how you might be able to collect some information, especially for items that you could score based on the based on observation and based on caregiver question. And actually, this th let me see if I could um, get back to this here real quickly. That section of the that section this section of the cognitive subtest that I showed you here. This is, we prepared this as part of our guidance for telepractice assessment. So you could actually look at the items and determine, well, these are items that I could theoretically present um, using, that I could theoretically score using observation. Some of these items I could score using caregiver question. The structured presentation is a little more complicated if you're using remote assessment, but if you would go to pearsonassessments.com and go to our telepractice page, and then you scroll down to to the Bailey 4, you could see our telepractice guidance for Bailey 4. Here's the long and short. You won't be able to derive actual standardized scores for cognitive language and motor because you probably won't be able to present um, many of the items, especially the items that require the structured presentation in that remote format. Wonderful. Thanks, Gloria. Fantastic explanation of, of a lot of information there. And um, there's another question just in, which is, can we use the Bailey for with bilingual children? Is that something you're able to address? Okay, yes, thank you. And again, that's um, a little complicated. It was standardized with English speaking infants and toddlers. And especially when you think about the language components, um, language is, is so different. Um, across languages, so it's not, you can't just translate. So I would say at this point, the answer is is no. Um, although you can collect information from parents and caregivers using the social, emotional and adaptive behavior questionnaire. Fabulous. And another one just in, can a psychologist give the cognitive section and the speech path um, give the language section? Um, I wonder if you oh, could speak for sure. to that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. The Bailey 4 and the Baileys, the Bailey, the Bailey 2 and the Bailey 3, they were always designed to be used as part of this interdisciplinary team format. Um, and in fact, um, we have a, a separate record form for those. Um, we can um, respond to that in more detail. But for now, we want to thank you so much for joining us. We're going to end here in one minute. Thank you so much for joining us. If we missed any questions, we'll respond to those via email. Thanks, everybody.